Well, I do want to add my welcome on this smoky Sunday morning. I'm so glad that you are here worshiping with us. Thank you for joining us online. Your worship matters. It matters when we direct our praise and our attention and our lament to God. It's the way we were meant to be oriented. It was the way our world was meant to work. So thank you so much for being a part of my community of faith who does that. Well, here we are in August, and uh, it's been a hot, dry one, huh, this summer? Uh, Scott and I think that we may need to start over with our lawn. I believe it has moved beyond the dormant stage to the just dead stage. And so there's probably gonna be some watering and some seeding this fall that we'll be doing. Um, we really do have about one month left uh, till our rhythms change, right? We move out of those summer rhythms into those fall rhythms. And I have to say, a lot of us here on staff are super excited and many of our volunteers really excited about some new things that'll be coming back. We'll be having our full spiritual formation programming on Wednesday nights for all ages that will include dinner, our uh, second Sunday lunches are coming back, so we have a chance to not just worship together, but to hang out, chat, catch up with each other, at least monthly. And we're gonna start it all off with that fabulous kickoff event with the roasted pork and the corn. Um, so there are just some things that feel so like fresh air but familiar air. Like it's good, it's fresh, and it is familiar. But at the same time, there are lots of big things that have changed. A sense that the world we're coming back to this fall is not the same. It's never gonna be the same. We know the Delta variant is out there doing its thing, and vaccination does help, but it feels like things could shift so easily. The climate, the changes in our climate are pronounced and the price of those climate changes is rising. We know we need to live differently on the earth, but we don't quite know how to do that. How does that work? What changes will help? And then we're gonna just continue to wrestle with the issues that the death of George Floyd raised. Um, I feel like we're doing this collective soul searching, trying to make changes and, and understand um, in ways that will help heal our racism. But debates rage as to how to do that, and my own actions, the things I'm doing, feel pretty negligible. You know, so there really is for me this blend of feeling like some things that I just love and treasure are coming back, and some really big things have changed forever, and I need to live differently, but I don't quite know what different looks like. As I've prayed and asked God's power and wisdom around me um, in this new season, words like humility and resilience and willingness to change seem to buzz in conversations and in books. And I think those words are helpful, but even as I say them now, I can't help but hunger for something more. So when I'm hungry, scripture is a good place to go. And as I've turned to scripture in this season, there are two stories that have emerged for me as models of how to respond in a time in which it feels like big things are changing and I feel a little helpless in the midst of it. Both of these stories are about fairly insignificant people who respond to huge issues beyond their control in astounding ways. I'd like to look at those two stories these next two Sundays, and I'd like to invite us to just consider them as potential mentors for the journey that we are on. 
Our first story is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. So if you wanna pull out your phones and call up your Bible apps, that's where we're gonna be today, Luke chapter three, and we're gonna start in verse 32 and go to verse 43. I wanna set up the context of this scripture. We are actually in the middle of the crucifixion of Jesus. The trials are over, the disciples have fled, and our story takes place during those few hours that Jesus hangs in agony for salvation's sake. When I've come to this text before, I've often thought, well, now there's nothing left to do but die, right? And I'm wrong about that. There is so much that happens on the cross, and I don't just mean theologically. I think you'll understand what I mean as we really look closely at this text today. So let's read it together. Again, we're at Luke 23, and we're starting with verse 32. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. That's being Jesus. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. So I wanna pause here in the story. This is kind of the setup for the introduction of our main character. I want you to notice Jesus. He is all about forgiveness. I mean, that's what this cross and this experience is about for him. Forgiveness is what he's all about while he's on the cross, and forgiveness is why he's on the cross. Jesus is here to open the path of forgiveness for humanity, to bring the possibility of reconciliation, eternal reconciliation with God, to undo the profound damage that sin and evil had done. And Jesus stays focused on his mission by praying for the people who are actually brutally executing him. And they are oblivious to this gift. The common people seem to be standing by in stunned silence. There's no movement on their part. They could either be helpless or apathetic. We don't know. The leaders of the people want to make sure that shame is heaped on Jesus. They don't want to just bury his body. They want to bury his reputation and his work. They want to make sure that all of the watching people know that Jesus is a liar and a fraud. And the soldiers just join in the mockery in the coronation of a Roman Caesar, the drinking of wine and toasting would have been part of the royal celebration. They offer Jesus cheap vinegar to show him and to show everyone that he is exactly the kind of king the Jews deserve. He's a joke. The inscription of the charges also is a mockery and a warning. Here will hang anyone who claims to be the king of the Jews. Caesar is the only king of the Jews. On top of this, this cruelty that swirls around, Jesus is forgiving them. In the midst of that wash of anger, 
He stands in forgiveness. I'm always struck by this sort of rejoicing in someone's death. We've seen it in our history before as though cruelty just seems to call out all in us that is especially cruel. The author Luke does something redemptive with all this cruel mockery. He ironically has all this mockery reveal the truth about Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah of God, the savior of his people, and he is the king of the Jews. He is doing all of this to save his people. He will, in the end, be resurrected, completely nullifying this execution. The inscription above his head is the truth. What these men caught up in cruelty say in order to bring more suffering actually declares the truth and reveals that Jesus in his death is both king and savior who will do whatever it takes to redeem his people. Let's keep reading because now we get to meet our main character. Verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So this criminal takes my breath away. I mean, just look at him. That word that is translated criminal here is used only when someone, someone's life has really been rendered completely useless. It is used exclusively for people who are condemned to death for the evil they have done. It is a label that essentially declares the only good this person can do now for the sake of the world is to die. This man humbly accepts the punishment that he is receiving. He acknowledges that he is getting exactly what he deserves. And he also knows that Jesus is not getting what he deserves. He silences the other criminal by reminding him that they will both face God and that this cross they're hanging on is nothing compared to that moment when they will need to give account for the way that they have lived their lives to their creator. This criminal is somehow aware that the minutes they have left to live matter in the light of eternity. But it's actually what he says next that is so astounding. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So for this man, to make that statement reveals a level of insight into what is happening that is nothing short of miraculous. Somehow he knows that Jesus on the cross continues to be the Messiah and the King. He knows that Jesus' work of bringing about his kingdom has not stopped. Somehow he knows that Jesus' work, his cross here is part of what he needs to do in order to be Savior and Lord. 
No one else knows this. The, none of the disciples are aware of this. None of the leaders of the people or the crowds that followed him know this. Not even this, the devil and his demons know this. Those lovely women who stay with Jesus, completely oblivious to this truth. This criminal knows that the cross is the way to salvation and the way to the new kingdom that Jesus is building. That kingdom will be founded on this moment. And he is, far as we know, the only person on planet Earth that gets this. And his response is to ask this mighty king to save him too and to bring him into the everlasting kingdom. It's astounding. The grace of God that has opened this man, man's eyes in this moment is oceanic. He's the first Christian. He's the first to believe and receive the forgiveness of God purchased on the cross. What a wonder. I have often heard this man talked about in terms of grace. But it's usually said because he literally has no life to live uh, left. He has no changed life to kind of give back to the kingdom. He's sort of the archetype of the abundance of grace God offers us because basically he can offer nothing in response to the wondrous salvation of Jesus. And I want to honor that truth for us all. But I want to point out that this man had a profound impact on Jesus' death. After this man's words, the mocking stops. In the Gospel of Luke, this man's rebuke silences not just the other criminal, but the whole crowd of mockers. The verbal abuse seems to end with this man's reprimand. You see, God's grace doesn't just flow to this criminal, but it spills over to Jesus, who no longer needs to endure the haranguing. And not only that, but Jesus is no longer alone. He's accompanied now by someone who knows and believes in what he is doing. This criminal gives Jesus community as he dies with the weight of the sins of the world on him. God's grace was all over this man. And though he only had a few hours, the ministry that he offered my Lord is precious. I'm so grateful for his courage and his presence with Jesus. I can just imagine the joy of Jesus and this nameless criminal as they were reunited in paradise that very night. The wondrous grace that flows to and through this helpless condemned man gives me so much hope. I mean, he couldn't even move his arms and legs. He only had a few hours left to live, but he was a fountain of grace, maybe the only grace that was present at that brutal moment in history. I mean, just maybe, if I too can remember who Jesus is, maybe if I can stay humble, Maybe if I can be brave, maybe that kind of insight and ministry might flow through my life too. In fact, I think that's the invitation for us today, Salem. Do you know that there is grace for us all in this time? Do you know that God is deeply at work in the painful and dark places and that we are never too helpless to be a conduit 
of grace. If we still have life and breath, it's not over. Let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you for this beautiful story captured by Luke. I thank you for this precious man and your wondrous grace that flowed over him and on to our Lord in his darkest hour. Lord Jesus, for me and my friends, we ask for that kind of grace to flow in our lives. May we have the insight and the power that this man had to respond to the darkness and the painful broken places in our world. Come, Lord Jesus, continue your work and your grace to us and through us. Amen.